Here we are on the 25th day of 2023, and we're looking at three different verses of the Tao Te Ching, just reflecting and seeing what it is that wants to be explored more deeply. Um, verse 23, express yourself completely, then keep quiet. Be like the forces of nature. When it blows, there's only wind. When it rains, there's only rain. When the clouds pass, the sun shines through. So this, this first part of verse 23 to me is a um, is an expression of this uh, principle. Uh, well, a, a, a deeper, more general principle is to always look to nature as our example for what we how we want to behave as humans as well. It's also an expression of this principle of that life is constantly changing, um, that there's all these manifestations, there's seasons, there's cycles, there's phases, and yet it's all part of one thing. And to allow yourself, right, in your own um, emotional life, for instance, emotion, <laughs> feelings are supposed to move. And to allow ourselves to be in all these different experiences and recognize the Tao in all of them. Um, and then he says, if you open yourself to the Tao, you are at one with it and you can embody it. So now we have this theme of opening. He's asking us to open. So you can start to feel what that might mean, right? In that first part, you can feel what it might mean as you go through your day to be like, oh, am I judging my anger or my sadness? Okay, maybe I allow this like to come through like a like a weather's pattern. Um, and then this, what does this mean? Play around with this for yourself. What does it mean to open yourself to something? Can you open yourself to insight? Then you are at one with it. And you can use it. And then this is interesting. If you open yourself to loss, you are at one with loss and you can accept it completely. So see if you can feel what this looks like to accept it when you're the rain, to accept it uh, when, to open yourself to all these different experiences, to allow yourself to be at one with them. And then this, he, he, the endings are always so brilliant, right? Of these, I, I mean, often there's really great takeaways. Open yourself to the Tao, then trust your natural responses and everything will fall into place. I love that. Betsy says, I'm thinking about the many paradoxes and then the imperative to trust and let go. Holly says, I like this set too. The thought that arises for me is around the advice to be still and watch. I take if we try, we become the opposite. But then I think there has to be effort too, which is, I guess, you're, to do your work and stand back. Yes. Yes. Um, let's just kind of hone in on 23, um, oh, sorry, 24 and 25, and then um, we'll see what, if there's any other comments. But yes, amen to all of that. So 24, um, and this, this is, is kind of what Holly is talking about. If we try too hard, if we're trying to do something, we're not it, right? So in this last verse, we heard be open and at one with. He doesn't say imitate. He doesn't say manufacture. Open and become one with. Okay. So, so now in 24, he says, he who stands on tiptoe doesn't stand firm. He who rushes ahead doesn't go far. He who tries to, tries to shine, dims his own light. Now, just those, can you think of that in your own life? I mean, I was reminding myself of this yesterday when I was trying to be on this work spree to get all this stuff done. And I did, I woke up a little late this morning. I was a couple of minutes late to this, this morning because I kind of like pushed myself a little too hard. Right. And, um, and then this tiptoe, when you're in tiptoe, you don't stand firm. It reminds me of a verse way earlier that says, uh, success is as dangerous as failure. And he talks about if you're 
Usually if you're on a ladder, you need to do, you have your feet on the ground. If you're on a ladder, it's not a very stable place to be. Um, this reminds me of that too. If you're always trying to reach to whatever's next, you never are in your presence and in your power. He who defines himself can't know who he really is. That's interesting. We have to do some amount of sort of defining ourselves or identifying ourselves, I suppose. But I think what he's saying here is if we're, this is a huge theme in yoga sutras. If you're attached to your identity, then you're going to mistake yourself for the manifestations. First one, don't mistake the essence of things for their outer appearance or for a particular expression of them. What you are, of course, is the Tao. So if you define yourself narrowly and get stuck there, you miss what you are. He who has power over others can't empower himself. Wow. That one, <laughs> that one has become so much more resonant with me over this last handful of years. Um, I have a whole version of the Tao Te Ching. It's not my favorite version. The Stephen Mitchell version is just so gorgeous, but I do have a whole version that really, really focuses on the politics of the Tao Te Ching. It's about the, the translation of the title is the Tao of Power. But I've been thinking about this so much and I really, really admire this picture that the Tao Te Ching gives us, this wisdom that it gives us, that as long as you are trying to succeed by standing on the heads of others, guess what? You are reliant on them to stand on. You are empowering yourself on the backs of others, on the heads of others. And unfortunately, we, we live, we're living, or I don't know if it's fortunate or not. Some aspects of this are, are, are fortunate. We are living at a particular time where we have a lot of privilege. Um, many of us, everyone who's here, um, and a lot of that has come through colonialism and, and through, through um, I mean, in our country, so much of the wealth and industry and capital and and what we have here uh, was stolen. It's all in stolen land, um, and and so much of 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 that was created by slaves. And throughout throughout human history, this is true. The power of the Tao, the power of the master, is of a di different level than the material power. We're not stuck in the manifestations. We're not stuck in the material. We we have access to what is beyond that. And we see that a real power, if you, somebody who's really empowered doesn't need to steal the labor or the land of others. He who clings to his work will create nothing that endures. If you want to accord with the Tao, just do your job and then let go. All right, a lot to sit with. I'm gonna dive into the very last one and then we'll see if there's final comments um, and we'll just keep keep sitting with it. Um, and, and I will say, okay, I'm just gonna also just reflect this, this idea of, you know, what Holly was saying, these paradoxes, uh, or sorry, I think it was Betsy, but you know, this obviously throughout he is, he's, he's, catching us in these paradoxes. He's showing us the way that the conscious mind cannot think its way to the Tao. The conscious mind deals with duality and black and white and right or wrong. It's totally fine for this little, little level of reality. Um, but by the paradoxes, as they frustrate us or confuse us, what they're really showing is the limitations of the mind and indicating that we actually, our, our practice, our work, and Holly was asking, what is, so what, what do we do? <laughs> you know, um, we try to learn how to be at one with the Tao. We try to learn how to open ourselves to reality. And we recognize that the effort, the mind only kind of knows how to, how to work quote unquote, in one way. And that we are going to have to go 
below, beyond, deeper. We're going to have to explore other aspects of our consciousness or our being or our reality. We're going to have to try different approaches to life itself in order to start to feel what he's describing and to start to catch ourselves. And I do this all day, catch ourselves trying to do it the old way, trying to try, (laughs) trying to fix it, trying to solve it, trying to get out of the paradox via the mind. Now, 25 is a description of the Tao, the perfect Tao. Um, There was something formless and perfect before the universe was born. It is serene, empty, solitary, unchanging, infinite, eternally present. Um, So all of that, it sounds like it could have been pulled right out of the Upanishads, uh, an Indian ancient Indian text predates the Yoga Sutras. Um, It's actually a big collection of texts, but um, Isha Upanishad in particular, you know, talks about Brahman as being this, describes um, the ultimate reality, the ultimate truth of the universe as God, as the divine, and um, sounds very much like this. But what you don't see I got to say, very often in the Indian literature, which is interesting for whatever reason in the Sanskrit literature, um, you don't see nearly as much talk about the divineness of the feminine. And we'll see it even more throughout the text. Um, References to the mother we've already seen. Um, But this, I love this. I love thinking about about this as the metaphor, as the Tao is the great mother. Um, it flows through all things inside and outside and returns to the origin of things. Your mother's DNA is in you, right? Um, at some point you were in her, but it's it's sort of this inside, outside, everywhere aspect of the Tao he's describing. And then, and, and so for just the beginning of verse 25, this is something that I recommend for anybody who wants to kind of drop in, you know, for meditation, if that, that poetry of it really kind of feels inspiring at all. I was sitting with it a lot today in our 25 minutes of silence. Can I just keep returning to that aspect that is everywhere inside, outside? Um, eternally present, always real. And then at the end of this verse, uh, this is a really interesting set of four that he gives us now. The Tao, the universe, earth, and human. He calls them the four great powers. And then he tells us the order. Human follows the earth. And those of you who worked with me for a while, I don't know if I've spoken about it much recently, but you know, I've said for a long time that my deity is mother earth and expressing that particularly in the feminine has been something that's been a really important part of my own deconditioning living in a patriarchy that has taught me in mostly mostly subtle ways sometimes very not subtle ways that that the masculine is hierarchically superior to the feminine uh so anyway my 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 mother earth all my Mother Earth stuff was going on long before I found this book. And you can maybe understand why it spoke to me so deeply and, and, and already felt so true when I first encountered this. So, and that's already kind of where I've been at, you know, was where, where I was at before. Human follows the earth. I wanted to sync myself with the natural cycle of the earth. I saw the earth as being wiser, more ancient than little Aaron. And I wanted to let her be my teacher, my guru, my deity. And started practicing, basically giving all my practices to the earth herself. You can use this. Whatever help you have, I know you give back to me. Okay. The earth follows the universe. And then we we have a little bit of a sense at this point of how vast the universe is. I mean, again, the, the mind cannot actually really fathom it. How tiny the earth actually is. And of course, the Earth is part of the universe. It, it fits in with this bigger whole. It's 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 dancing the same way that the cells in your body are a part of your body, the same way that every little creature here is part of the Earth. 
So if you can imagine how vast the universe is, the Tao is even greater. The Tao is the mother of the universe. And she, unlike earthly mothers, never, never dies. And so not only is her DNA in us, we're not just carrying it on. She is always here. She's where we always return. She is what we really are. Okay. So I don't see any more comments um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up here and I look forward to seeing or hearing any comments from you guys as you continue to do the work. I, um, I'm also happy to hear about not just the text itself, but anything that's been shifting for you just by kind of showing up regularly or, or, uh, meditating. We're starting to meditate for longer periods. We're going to keep doing that to the end of the month. And then we're going to shift the way that we, we do things here a little bit. And um, we'll still be practicing together every day in some way. But um, 30 minutes is what we meditate, the length of time that we usually meditate on retreat. But usually on these, um, you know, online things, we just go up to 20 and then we stop. So I'm also curious about what what, what happens there, you know, and, and it's okay if sometimes just like these paradoxes kind of frustrate us until we are able to go past them. Um, in ancient Greek philosophy, they call this the aporia, the place where you realize that your own mind has created a wall that it can't pass and that you have to go beyond. Um, in the same way in our practice, you know, if you're, if you're coming up against a little bit of discomfort, so you can kind of sit with that and go, oh, this is my edge. I'm used to meditating 10 minutes or 20 minutes and she's asking me for 26. Oh, um, you know, sit with that, play with that. But also, if you're kind of, it doesn't help us to go to be like way out of our comfort zone. That can actually just disturb your day. And so I also encourage you to start, you know, you can pull out of these a little bit earlier as you need and do some journaling about the the, the text or just go look back through some other, other verses that you loved um, or do a little stretching um, and just see, stay with us if you can. But I, yeah, encourage you to do all of that. Make your own. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you guys tomorrow.